Okay, thanks very much, and thanks for everyone who's uh, stuck with us to the end. Uh, after hearing, I think, some really nice summaries of the huge amount of data that the project has generated and the different ways that the community can get access to it, we'll finish with a discussion of um, some specific examples of how the Thousand Genomes Project can be used in disease association studies. Um, so obviously, in addition to the, uh, the really interesting biological insights coming from the data itself, the project hopes that using the data more broadly will let us um, gain all kinds of insights in all kinds of different projects. Um, so to sort of frame the question, uh, th there's a lot of talks at this meeting and uh, thinking about doing genome-wide association studies of complex disease, and we can frame the purpose of doing those studies in, in two parallel goals, and those are to explain the heritability of disease and to understand the biology of disease. And Eric Lander in the opening talk put this really nicely in that sometimes we think we'll go heritability first and then understand biology, but really the two are at the very least happening in parallel and possibly it's the biology will crack first. And in, in terms of these two goals, how they'll eventually be used in a translational sense, um, heritability will hopefully be useful in things like predicting disease and predicting prognosis of disease, where, on the other hand, understanding biology of disease might be useful in developing treatments. These are obviously very forward-looking things, but the Thousand Geoms project data can be used in both of these goals, and I'll mention examples of each of these. So, for the in the first case, uh, understanding the heritability of disease, this statistical technique of imputation is the principal way that we use Thousand Genomes data. And uh, in terms of, of biological understanding, um, annotation in a very broadly classed sense, um, which I include, by which I include annotating a region of the genome and understanding all of the places where there's variation so that we can use that variation to interpret signals we see in association studies. Um, so starting with imputation, and I'll mention um, a little bit more technological detail in a moment, but this is just some data from, um, from HapMap, actually, before 1,000 genomes. And the x-axis is showing uh, allele frequencies going from rare to common SNPs. And um, the y-axis, these curves, are showing essentially improvement um, by having more and more reference samples available. So imputation is basically using a reference population to predict genotypes in some targeted GWAS data. And the key point is that for common variation, we already do a very good job of being able to do imputation using um, the relatively uh, small number of samples available in the HapMap and the 1,000 Genomes pilot data, but increasing the number of samples available really increases the accuracy of imputation at low frequency variation. So this is a key observation that to accurately impute low frequency variants, we need a large number of reference samples. Um, so imputation can be done with a number of programs. Uh, I've listed the three that I'm most familiar with. There are a few others. Um, these in include uh, Impute, the second version of which is really optimized for modern imputation problems. Uh, it was developed in Oxford by uh, Brian Howey and Jonathan Marchini. Um, Beagle was developed by uh, Brian and Sharon Browning, previously in Auckland, New Zealand, now at the University of Washington. And finally, Mac and its uh, it, uh, follow-on program called Minimac, uh, developed by Gonzalo Abacasis' group in Michigan. Um, and each of these operates on a, on a similar principle, which I've alluded to and which Gil mentioned uh, at the beginning of the evening, which is you have a panel of reference samples which, have, which are extremely dense in the number of variants for which they have genotype data. So the 1,000 genomes, of course, has the complete sequence in the reference samples. And you use the, the correlation between those variants to be able to predict uh, that entire set of variation into a GWAS type sample where you have a small subset, say a few hundred thousand or maybe a million variants. Um, this is still a very computationally heavy duty process, especially when we get bigger and bigger reference sets. So this is, is an example that um, we did using the Thousand Genomes pilot data. We took the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, which was a very big first generation GWAS with um, 16,000 samples. We've now generated a combined SNP and INDEL um, uh, reference panel from the 1,000 Genomes pilot data. Uh, it's worth pointing out that this is becoming a routine practice, but aligning all of the data to the same strand, making sure the alleles are correctly set up, um, getting the files in the correct format can still be a big headache. Um, and I'll mention in a few minutes that um, the project is working to try to make these kinds of files available in as usable formats as possible. Um, but it's worth being aware that uh, it's still not a, a sort of push one button and go operation for the most part. Um, 
we did these analyses with the impute version 2 factory default settings, so you can twiddle those settings as well, although I think the recommended defaults are uh, certainly a good place to start. Um, it, you can't do this kind of analysis on the entire genome at once, so you have to split the genome into chunks, and then you, to get uh, good accuracy, you actually split it into overlapping chunks so that you don't lose any accuracy at the boundary of the chunks. Um, and we can submit each chunk to a job on our computing cluster. These, even these uh, small chunks are relatively um, uh, memory hungry, so we need them on machines with uh, between four and six gigs of memory. And to do this entire process requires two computing years of time. Um, so that is quite a lot. Um, we do have a big cluster, so it's, it doesn't take two actual years of time. And it scales approximately linearly with sample size. So if you scale back the 16,000 samples we were working with, which is obviously quite a huge data set, it takes about one or two hours to do each individual. So you can imagine if you had um, a couple of thousand individuals, it would take a couple of thousand compute hours. So again, as I mentioned, this is becoming a routine process, but it is still worth pointing out that um, you do need some, some serious computational hardware to do this on a large scale. Um, there are some interesting methodological developments that are happening that maybe will be able to help this. Um, this idea of pre-phasing can actually save a lot of time. So uh, again, simplistically, the imputation it, uh, algorithms are looking to find a, uh, a haplotype in the reference panel, which is very similar to the, to the skeletal genotypes in my GWAS set, and then fill in the missing data using the matched reference haplotype. Um, and the, the typical setup for these imputation software uh, algorithms today is to compare GWAS genotypes, so at just at each position you have the, the diploid genotype, and to try to match those combinations of genotypes to the phased haplotypes in the reference panels. Um, this obviously requires a combination of trying combinations of different versions of the phase within the genotype samples and then matching those versions to the possible reference haplotypes, which is computationally very intensive. You can phase your GWAS data in advance, so now you've gone from having a GWAS data set of genotypes to pairs of phased haplotypes, um, and you save this result, and then what you can do with that is now, it's a much simpler process, again, a very simple, um, simplified version of matching the individual phased haplotypes in your, in your target set to the reference, and that's much faster than, uh, you know, instead of doing pe having to do a square of the number of individuals, you're just scaling as the number of individuals. Also, by saving this information, you can then keep imputing in the future into different reference sets as they become available much faster than doing it from scratch each time. And this approach is implemented in uh, software flags in Impute V2 and Beagle. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a separate program called Minimac that does this uh, for Mac. Um, in terms of reference data sets, uh, in the past, what most um, groups you, doing imputation to GWAS have used the HapMap 2 and 3 data sets. These have HapMap 2, 270, scaling up to over 1,000 samples in HapMap 3, um, but a relatively small number of SNPs compared to what's been discovered in 1,000 genomes, so between uh, 1 and 2 million SNPs, really, in these uh, reference panels. Uh, what 1,000 genomes right now enables us to do is to obviously have a much greater number of variants, although in a relatively small number of samples, the 179 pilot samples. Um, as I mentioned, we now have a, we've generated a, a merged set of SNP and indel calls, so you can simultaneously impute SNPs and small indels, more than 10 million variants. Um, we just heard that there are genotypes for uh, deletions, not all the structural variations, but the project is aiming to form um, integrated call sets with SNPs, indels, and each class of structural variant that has genotypes so that you can run an imputation analysis across all kinds of variation together instead of trying to treat them each separately. So you'll eventually get a predicted genotype at any kind of variant discovered in 1,000 genomes in your disease sa samples. And we think this will be a really useful thing for people. Um, right now, you can, you can download the VCF data from 1,000 genomes, as, as has been mentioned. You'll have to then convert it to the formats that are required for each imputation program. I'll just point out that um, Jonathan and Brian in Oxford um, have specifically converted the uh, pilot calls to their impute format, so you can download ready-to-use files directly from their website, which I think is very helpful. And they'll plan, with some lag behind the project, to be releasing those formatted calls with each new release of project data. Um, and 
indeed, as we go forward, the whole Thousand Genomes project will eventually have many, many samples as well as many, many variants. And we'll continue to try to release these phased combined sets of SNPs, indels, and structural variants. Um, it's worth pointing out that while I think these are going to be really useful, each of those classes of variation has very different properties in how confident we are in the genotypes. So SNPs we're pretty good at calling right now and generally have very high confidence. Indels are getting very good but uh, aren't perfect. And structural variation is really still, um, there's a lot of development in calling genotypes. And so these kinds of, of joint data sets I think will come with very bold, humongous caveats saying that you have to be very careful interpreting the outcome depending on the kind of variation you're looking at. So I think it'll be good to get this into the public domain, but again, reminding people that uh, not all of the variant calls are created equal. Um, and I'll finish with, with a couple of examples. So here's uh, a GWAS plot of Crohn's disease. So um, anyone who's, who's worked on GWAS will be very familiar with these. The x-axis is just the position along chromosome 22. The y-axis is the, the significance of association with disease, each point being a SNP. And they're colored based on uh, green dots were genotyped in the original project. Um, blue dots, sorry, red dots were uh, genotyped, were imputed in a HapMap2 analysis. And the blue and gray dots are, are SNPs which weren't imputed in HapMap2, um, either already discovered in dbSNP or else just discovered by 1,000 genomes. You'll see there are two strong peaks on this plot. The red line is genome-wide significance. Um, one at 28 megabases and one at uh, about 42 megabases. And that, in fact, most of the signal is coming from the gray and blue dots, which were only discovered in 1,000 genomes. And so this hit at the 28 megabase position was completely missed in the original WTCCC, as well as a meta-analysis of Crohn's disease in 2008. The p-value was bigger than 10 to the minus 4, so it wasn't followed up. Um, and it's worth pointing out that the key SNP from 1,000 genomes that really makes this a significant association is only 3% allele frequency in European. So it's this class of low-frequency variation that 1,000 genomes is really just allowing us to scratch. Now this hit, you might say, well, maybe it's a false positive, but in fact, uh, we're just about to publish an enlarged meta-analysis of Crohn's with over 20,000 total samples, which absolutely confirms that this is a true Crohn's disease association. Um, but the hit SNP in that analysis, which use HapMap-based imputation, is 13%. So in essence, we found by a much larger set of samples uh, a signal at a, a SNP that's probably only very weakly in LD with the causal SNP. It's at 13% rather than the likely causal SNP at 3%. So this is really cool in that in this particular instance, had we had the 1,000 genomes reference, we might have been able to find this gene with just the original WTCCC samples of about 5,000 instead of having to do the much larger meta-analysis. Now. Uh, as a word of caution, these things aren't leaping out all over the place, and I've chosen a very interesting example. Um, we also have this thing to the right at, at uh, 40 megs, and um, that isn't supported at all in the meta-analysis. So it is still difficult to work out all of the, the uh, sort of tweaks in doing imputation-based analysis with 1,000 genomes. Um, it's worth pointing out that that very top blue SNP is, in fact, an indel, which might imply that, again, the indels aren't quite as reliable as the SNPs yet. Um, I'd like to just also mention this idea of, of validation and gold standards. The project did a lot of genotyping to validate the sequence calls, um, and this is really useful, but it's also important to keep in mind that I don't think either is always the gold standard. Um, so what I've shown here is in the genotype data, uh, the X and Y axes are the intensity of uh, one allele, so allele C at this particular location, and the other axis is the intensity of allele T from the genotyping um, algorithm, the genotyping experiment. Now, Calling genotypes is basically just coloring in the dots, so you could color in blue for one homozygous cluster and green for a heterozygous cluster. But what we've done here is instead of using the guesses from the genotyping experiment, we've colored in the genotype intensities with the sequence calls. So in this example, you can see these are the three populations from the low coverage data. They basically agree perfectly. The variant doesn't exist in the African or Asian populations. There are a number of heterozygous individuals in the European population, and um, the sequence calls, which are the green colors, have perfectly, uh, are perfectly concordant with the, um, the genotype intensities. We can see, you probably can barely see this actually, there is one green dot in the YRI box. In essence, this is a rare variant, a singleton variant discovered in the sequencing, which also is nicely genotyped. So this is an important thing going forward, obviously, because we want to get accurate data on rare variation. And it's reassuring that at least some of the time, both sequencing and genotyping can, can get high accuracy for rare variation. Um, in other circumstances, the sequencing clearly makes a mistake. 
So here this variant was discovered in the Asians. The sequence uh, genotypes are exactly concordant with what we'd expect by the genotyping. But you can see that this variant is actually very polymorphic in the African population. Um, there are, in fact, not just heterozygotes, but also non-reference homozygotes here. Yet the sequencing didn't discover this at all. So in this particular case, within that population, the sequencing missed the variant. Um, you can also see uh, the opposite happening. And this is a little bit hard to see. But the genotype intensity data here isn't showing very much signal. It's all kind of munged up to the left side. But what you can see is that if we color in the dots based on the sequence, there's a pretty clear striping effect of blue reference homozygotes, green heterozygotes, and a couple of red non-reference homozygotes. So in this case, the sequence has pretty clearly picked up a rare variant. But for whatever reason, the probe used to do the genotyping experiment hasn't been able to distinguish them very well. So it's worth thinking that as we try to build gold standard reference sets, uh, it's a combination, really, of interrogating the sequence and the genotype kinds of data sets to be able to really know what the truth is. Um, so that's using, uh, s switching now from using imputation to, to try to discover new associations in data sets. We can also use the wealth of new variation in 1,000 genomes to try to annotate existing GWAS uh, results. So for example, this is showing um, different classes of functional variation, so um, non-synonymous, stop, uh, splice the HGMD uh, disease mutations. And basically, their enrichment or depletion relative to um, neutral variation uh, at different derived allele frequencies. So what you can see is that at the right-hand side of the graph for high derived allele frequencies, as we'd expect, these functional variants are much less common. They're below that dashed line, which is the, the rate of this kind of, uh, the rate at that frequency of neutral variation. On the left-hand side, we see many more uh, we see an enrichment of these kinds of variation being very low frequency. So we need projects like 1,000 Genomes to be able to discover these, uh, these interesting functional variants because they're, they're hugely skewed towards being low frequency. Um, and there are some cases where a GWAS hit SNP is really strongly correlated, so say R squared greater than 0.9 with a functional variant, and that might be a really um, useful smoking gun to annotate that functional variant as a possible causal allele, but there's still a lot left to be discovered and, and a lot of evidence suggesting that functional um, protein coding changes aren't the whole story in explaining GWAS hits because less than 10% of GWAS hit SNPs have a very strong R squared greater than 0.9 um, coding SNP in the 1000 Genomes data. So to finish off, um, 1000 Genomes is definitely going to become the default reference panel. Um, it is going to incorporate all the information that's currently in HapMap data and then some. Um, in addition to imputation, which the project will support by releasing these reference data sets, um, it also enables the discovery and annotation of uh, variants, the standardization, standardization of file formats across um, many different types of data that the project generates, and we've heard a lot about that, and the development of genotyping products. So companies like Illumina are now building arrays with two and a half or five million SNPs and indels all generated from the 1,000 Genomes data. So those are going to enable a new generation of GWAS. Um, and finally, coming to grips with the subtleties of the data, so I mentioned how the different uh, types of variation are at different states of maturity. This is still going to evolve over time, and the project is going to really try to move forward in generating really high-quality data sets. Uh, so I'll finish there. Uh, obviously, most of this work was done by the huge project. Um, Gonzalo, Brian, Brian, Jonathan have obviously developed imputation methods, which are really useful to the community. Um, Daniel and James helped with some of the functional annotation. Uh, and Luke in my group really did a lot of work on the imputation. And there we were at ASHG last year. I don't think our picture this year will be quite as nice. Thanks very much. Yes. Sorry, could you repeat that? So the question is whether there's any plan for the, the individual sequences part of 1,000 genomes to get benefit from their data. Um, so these individuals are completely anonymized. There's no way to connect their sequence back to them. So no, they'll get no direct benefit, just the hopefully indirect benefit that the world will get from learning something new about medicine. Yeah. Okay, two questions. I was hoping you could help me understand a few things. What is the overlap, if any, between individuals from HapMap and the 1,000 Genomes data? Um, were the same individuals used? Are there some that were the same and some that aren't? 
Uh, so the overlap is, is very substantial. Um, are all of them in the HapMap 3? So most of them come, so the HapMap was in phases itself, mm -hmm. and I think that all of the 1,000 genomes, pilot individuals at least, are in the HapMap. The populations for the full 1,000 genomes project are actually quite a bit more diverse than just the HapMap, so mm -hmm. many of those are, are brand new individuals. Okay, and the second question is, um, why aren't all HapMap SNPs represented in the 1,000 Genomes data? Um, that's a good question. This really gets to, to calibrating sensitivity and specificity of discovering variation in the sequence data. So there are real variants, such as ones that were actually genotyped by the HapMap, um, which just were missed by the low coverage sequencing. It doesn't find everything. Um, that being said, we're hoping in the future, we're going to start applying many technologies to these samples, so we'll do big genotyping chips, high coverage exon sequencing, low coverage whole genome sequencing, array CGH um, experiments on structural variation, and we hope eventually to release combined data sets which will have the best of every single experiment. So it will really be as good a guess as we can make at every position in the genome. And that will eliminate the problem you're seeing where we'll have filled in the, the missed sequence variants with the genotype results. Um, so, for those of us eager to start using data from the full project as an imputation reference panel, can you clarify the expected timeline of when we'll start to see the first wave of VCF phased files from the um, larger sample sizes? Uh, so we did just discuss this before the meeting started, um, and the goal is to, um, we're, we're trying to sort of phase the, the future releases so that on the one hand there won't be too many, but on the other hand we'll get useful data out soon. So the goal is very soon. Um, we're going to release an interim set of variant calls from about 650 samples. Um, the timeline for getting phased reference sets from that is probably early next year. Um, and then a bigger, a bigger release will be aimed to be generated and have preliminary analysis for the Cold Spring Harbor Biology of Genomes meeting in May of next year. And then I think another hopefully big release by late 2011. Okay, I think everyone's ready for the bar.